Translated by Bhikkhu Sujito. Suttacentral.net. Long Discourses 19. The Great Steward. The Council of the Gods 8 Genuine Praises on Sanankumara 8 Genuine Praises The Story of the Steward. The Story of the Great Steward. So I have heard. At one time the Buddha was staying near Rajagaha, on the vulture's peak mountain. Then, late at night, the fairy Pankasika, lighting up the entire vulture's peak, went up to the Buddha, bowed, stood to one side, and said to him, Sir, I would tell you of what I heard and learned directly from the gods of the thirty-three. Tell me, Pankasika, said the Buddha. Won the council of the gods. Sir, it was more than a few days ago, on the fifteenth day Sabbath on the full moon day at the invitation to admonish held at the end of the rainy season, when all the gods of the thirty-three were sitting together in the Hall of Justice. A large assembly of gods was sitting all around, and the four great kings were there. The great king Dhataratha was seated to the east, facing west, in front of his gods. The great king Viralhaka was seated to the south, facing north, in front of his gods. The great king Virapakha was seated to the west, facing east, in front of his gods. The great king Vesavana was seated to the north, facing south, in front of his gods. When the gods of the thirty-three have a gathering like this, that is how they are seated. After that come our seats. Sir, those gods who had been recently reborn in the company of the thirty-three after leading the spiritual life under the Buddha outshine the other gods in beauty and glory. The gods of the thirty-three were uplifted and overjoyed at that. Full of rapture and happiness, saying, the heavenly hosts swell, while the demon hosts dwindle. Seeing the joy of those gods, Saka, Lord of Gods, celebrated with these verses. The gods rejoice. The thirty-three with their Lord. Revering the realized one. And the natural excellence of the teaching. And seeing the new gods. So beautiful and glorious. Who have come here after leading. The spiritual life under the Buddha. They outshine the others. In beauty, glory, and lifespan. Here are the distinguished disciples. Of he whose wisdom is vast. Seeing this, they delight. The thirty-three with their Lord. Revering the realized one. And the natural excellence of the teaching. The gods of the thirty-three were even more uplifted and overjoyed at that, full of rapture and happiness, saying, The heavenly hosts swell, while the demon hosts dwindle. Two eight genuine praises seeing the joy of those gods, Saka, Lord of Gods, address them, gentlemen, would you like to hear eight genuine praises of the Buddha? Indeed we would, sir. Then Saka proffered these eight genuine praises of the Buddha. What do the good gods of the thirty-three think about how much the Buddha has acted for the welfare and happiness of the people, out of compassion for the world? for the benefit, welfare, and happiness of gods and humans. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who has such compassion for the world, apart from the Buddha. Also, the Buddha has explained the teaching well, visible in this very life, immediately effective. Inviting inspection, relevant, so that sensible people can know it for themselves. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who explains such a relevant teaching, apart from the Buddha. Also, the Buddha has clearly described what is skillful and what is unskillful, what is blameworthy and what is blameless, what should be cultivated and what should not be cultivated, what is inferior and what is superior, and what is on the side of dark and the side of bright. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who so clearly describes all these things, apart from the Buddha. Also. The Buddha has clearly described the practice that leads to extinguishment for his disciples. And extinguishment and the practice come together, as the waters of the Ganges come together and converge with the waters of the Yamuna. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who so clearly describes the practice that leads to extinguishment for his disciples, apart from the Buddha. Also, possessions and popularity have accrued to the Buddha, so much that you'd think it would thrill even the aristocrats. But he takes his food. 
free of vanity. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who takes their food so free of vanity, apart from the Buddha. Also, the Buddha has gained companions, both trainees who are practicing, and those with defilements ended who have completed their journey. The Buddha is committed to the joy of solitude, but doesn't send them away. I don't see any teacher, past or present, so committed to the joy of solitude, apart from the Buddha. Also, the Buddha does as he says, and says as he does, thus, he does as he says, and says as he does. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who so practices in line with the teaching, apart from the Buddha. Also, the Buddha has gone beyond doubt and got rid of indecision. He has achieved all he wished for regarding the fundamental purpose of the spiritual life. I don't see any teacher, past or present, who has achieved these things, apart from the Buddha. These are the eight genuine praises of the Buddha proffered by Sakha. Hearing them, the gods of the thirty-three were even more uplifted and overjoyed. Then some gods thought, if only four fully awakened Buddhas might arise in the world and teach the Dhamma, just like the Blessed One. That would be for the welfare and happiness of the people, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, welfare and happiness of gods and humans. Other gods thought, let alone four fully awakened Buddhas, if only three fully awakened Buddhas, or two fully awakened Buddhas might arise in the world and teach the Dhamma, just like the Blessed One. That would be for the welfare and happiness of the people, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, welfare, and happiness of gods and humans. When they said this, Sakha said, It's impossible, gentlemen, for two perfected ones, fully awakened Buddhas to arise in the same solar system at the same time. May that blessed one be healthy and well, and remain with us for a long time. That would be for the welfare and happiness of the people, out of compassion for the world, for the benefit, welfare, and happiness of gods and humans. Then the gods of the thirty-three, having considered and deliberated on the matter for which they were seated together in the Hall of Justice, advised and instructed the four great kings on the subject. And each stood at their own seat without departing. The kings were instructed and heeded good advice. With clear and peaceful minds, they stood by their own seats. Then in the northern quarter a magnificent light arose and radiance appeared, surpassing the glory of the gods. Then Sakha, Lord of Gods, addressed the gods of the thirty-three, as indicated by the signs, light arising and radiance appearing, Brahma will appear. For this is the precursor for the appearance of Brahma, namely light arising and radiance appearing. As indicated by the signs, Brahma will appear. For this is the sign of Brahma. A light vast and great. 3. On Sanankumara then the gods of the thirty-three sat in their own seats, saying, We shall find out what has caused that light, and having realized it we shall go to it. And the four great kings did likewise. Hearing that, the gods of the thirty-three agreed in unison, We shall find out what has caused that light, and having realized it we shall go to it. When Brahma Sanankumara appears to the gods of the thirty-three, he does so after manifesting in a solid corporeal form, for the gods of the thirty-three aren't able to see a Brahma's normal appearance. When Brahma Sanankumara appears to the gods of the thirty-three, he outshines the other gods in beauty and glory, as a golden statue outshines the human form. When Brahma Sanankumara appears to the gods of the thirty-three, not a single god in that assembly greets him by bowing down or rising up or inviting him to a seat. They all sit silently on their couches with their joined palms raised, thinking, now Brahma Sanankumara will sit on the couch of whatever god he chooses. And the god on whose couch Brahma sits is overjoyed and brimming with happiness, like a king on the day of his coronation. Seeing the joy of those gods, Brahma Sanankumara celebrated with these verses. The gods rejoice. The thirty-three with their lord. Revering the realized one. And the natural excellence of the teaching. And seeing the new gods. So beautiful and glorious. 
who have come here after leading the spiritual life under the Buddha. They outshine the others in beauty, glory, and lifespan. Here are the distinguished disciples of he whose wisdom is vast. Seeing this, they delight the thirty-three with their Lord, revering the realized one and the natural excellence of the teaching. That is the topic on which Brahma Sanankumara spoke. And while he was speaking on that topic, his voice had eight qualities, it was clear, comprehensible, charming, audible, rounded, undistorted, deep, and resonant. He makes sure his voice is intelligible as far as the assembly goes, but it doesn't extend outside the assembly. When someone has a voice like this, they're said to have the voice of Brahma. Then the gods of the thirty-three said to Brahma Sanankumara, Good, great Brahma. Knowing this, we rejoice. And there are the eight genuine praises of the Buddha spoken by Saka, knowing them, too, we rejoice. For eight genuine praises. Then Brahma said to Saka, It would be good, Lord of Gods, if I could also hear the eight genuine praises of the Buddha. Saying, Yes, great Brahma, Saka repeated the eight genuine praises for him. Hearing them, Brahma Sanankumara was uplifted and overjoyed, full of rapture and happiness. Then Brahma Sanankumara manifested in a solid corporeal form, taking on the appearance of the youth Pankasika, and appeared to the gods of the thirty-three. Rising into the air, he sat cross-legged in the sky, like a strong man might sit cross-legged on a well-appointed couch or on level ground. There he addressed the gods of the thirty-three. 5. The story of the steward What do the gods of the thirty-three think about the extent of the Buddha's great wisdom? Once upon a time, there was a king named Disampati. He had a Brahmin high priest named the steward. Disampati's son was the prince, named Renu, while the steward's son was the student named Jodapala. There were Renu the prince, Jodapala the student, and six other aristocrats, these eight became friends. In due course the Brahmin steward passed away. At his passing, King Disampati lamented, at a time when I have relinquished all my duties to the Brahmin steward and amuse myself, supplied and provided with the five kinds of sensual stimulation, he passes away. When he said this, Prince Renu said to him, Sire, don't lament too much at the stewards.